Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, hope everybody is doing well in Karachi. We have been in a grip of a horrendous heat wave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give relief. Actually, it is slightly better today than it was uh, for the last week or so. Uh, and inshallah, inshallah, what we're going to try today is to complete the surah. So in case we go like a little over time, please bear with me because uh, inshallah, we do want to complete this uh, part of the Quran, inshallah, Surah Al-Anfal. Um, if you remember, last week we were doing ayah number uh, 48, where we were discussing how Shaitan kind of um, beautifies certain deeds for us and how he makes certain deeds look uh, glorified and uh, beneficial, although in reality they are not. And in the context of that, we were looking at certain concepts that are not clear in our head, right? We do need divine guidance and guidance of Rasulullah to recognize what righteous deeds are and also to recognize what is the dark side inside of me and how can I take that towards the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we were talking in that context that each and every one of us has this darkness inherently in, inside of us, right? And we need to bring it to our natural state of light the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Okay? So in that, we looked at uh, certain things. Uh, let's just begin formally and then inshallah let's talk about, I'm on, just give me one second. Let me fix this. Yeah. And then inshallah, uh, we will look at some other things that we generally get very confused about. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Assalatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wal Mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Habibina wa Shafi'ina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa shahbihi ajma'in, Rabbi yassir wa la tu'assir ya kareem, وافتح بالحق إنك الفتاح العليم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحيمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام So of all of those internal um, things that Shaitan beautifies for us as I, in ayah number 48, Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the shaitan made their deeds look, be look beautiful to their eyes and said, none of the people can overpower you today and I am a protector for you. But when the two groups faced each other, he turned on his heels and said, I quit. I'm seeing what you do not see. And I am scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe in punishment. Special reference to context, of course, is the battle of Badr that we have been talking about. So within this context of how Shaitan beautifies deeds and what are the internal things to clarify our heart, right? So this dark side and the light side, which is inside each and every human being inside you and me, we need to distinguish between, and we discussed this already last time, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reverence versus hypocrisy. These are all areas where shaitan sometimes very openly and sometimes in a very subtle way tries to deceive us, right? And he, love for others, he confuses it for love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so beautifying it in a way, right? The second thing we looked at was reverence versus hypocrisy. The third thing we looked at was inspiring gratitude versus boasting. The fourth thing was friendly competition versus envy. The fifth was authentic leadership versus love for authority. And now we're going to look at a few more. One being reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the tawakkul, versus laziness, right? Versus laziness. So how does shaitan... Um, in our heads and in our hearts confuse these two absolutely diametrically op uh, opposite phenomena. Tawakkul is reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kasl is the Arabic word for laziness, right? So relying or trusting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an action of the heart. And according to scholars that manifest the essence of true faith, right? So it is a spiritual state. All of this we are talking in terms of our spiritual state and the state of our hearts. Right? 
Um, this spiritual state of tawakkul or true reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when we acknowledge our fears and our vulnerability in trying to reach a goal and finding comfort in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and power, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has defined tawakkul in many, many different ways. Uh, in one hadith, he said that first you tie your camel and then you have tawakkul in Allah. So you do your bit and then leave the result to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another narration in Tirmidhi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, if you were to have tawakkul of Allah, uh, then he would provide for you just as he provides for the birds. They go out in the morning with empty stomachs and return full, right? So like the birds searching for food, a person who has tawakkul will know that Allah will provide for me as long as A, I pray for it and B, I work for it, right? So tawakkul doesn't mean that you should just sit there doing nothing, all right? Even if, um, even if they are eventually given, uh, what they are eventually given is not what was expected, they have faith that this is for the best, right? That is tawakkul. Can you all uh, can you all see my screen clearly? Yeah, everybody can see the screen clearly. You can just raise your hand or something if you can see the screen. Okay, all right, Jazakallah. Okay, that means you can. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I still get confused with the screen situation. All right. I think I need to. Right. Okay. So that is having reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We believe that the natural laws governing the world are a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's supreme will, right? And therefore, uh, pursuing series of predictable causes and effects is part of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean that we're just sitting there innate doing absolutely nothing, right? True reliance involves, uh, according to one scholar, holistic surrender to both the physical and spiritual laws in order to obtain our, uh, our goals, right? Laziness, on the other hand, is what? Kassel is the failure to act upon spiritual and worldly causes together. Hmm? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from kassel. From, uh, uh, from laziness, yeah? Because it is a spiritual disease. It is something in our heart that shaitan tells us and he tricks us into believing that they are, that we are actually having tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by not taking any worldly means. Hmm? By not, you know, the Allah, yes, Allah is the ultimate provider, yeah? But you're not, you're not, you're not meant to be lazy and not, you know, say for example, work hard, towards gaining knowledge or work towards being physically fit or work towards uh, uh, getting your, you know, uh, earning, earning a livelihood, et cetera, et cetera, right? Our bit is to work. The result is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually made a dua against the state of laziness. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So Rasulullah said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamni wal-hazni wal-ajzi wal-kasi. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I seek refuge in you from worry and grief, helplessness and laziness. And there are eight different states that are mentioned in this particular dua. So this trick is there as well. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and said, let not one of you refrain from working for his provision supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to provide while knowing that the sky does not rain gold and silver. What does that mean? Your true reliance for the result is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you don't get lazy. You don't just sit there doing nothing. That is very, very important. Many times people have this distorted uh, perspective of, uh, uh, of tawakkul, of reliance. As a just, and they justify their laziness and their inactivity to that, yeah? Students say, for example, will not study before an exam, thinking as long as I'm doing my salah, as long as I'm praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will make a miracle happen on their behalf. 
although alhamdulillah that is a possibility actually don't think that that is not a possibility yes allah can make that miracle happen yeah but that doesn't mean it is against tawakkul really not to work hard yourself right so somebody looking for a job uh, will not network will not sort of fix their resume or 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 you know have some effort in self development right and will simply say if it is meant for me it will happen yes if it is meant for you it will happen but that doesn't mean that you don't put an effort that is not the sunnah that is not the sunnah and this goes for everything this goes for absolutely everything even say for example for finding a rishta right you do your bit and then leave it to allah subhanahu wa taala right okay then the other thing that shaitan dupes us with is the difference between advising someone sincerely and condemning them advice and condemnation we get very very seriously uh, uh, confused with that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us uh, ad-deen an-nasiha religion is sincere good or advice it was asked ya rasulullah to whom and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to allah his book his messenger the leaders of the believers and their common people and their common people right advising is something that is done for the benefit of the receiver when you see something whether it is your own child whether it is a friend whether it is a religious leader whether it is a community leader whether it is uh, your child's friend any anyone that you see that that you know maybe there is some room for improvement or you see a glaring mistake Hmm. that has happened and we all make mistakes right whether it's an outright sin or whether it's a slip of the tongue or whatever we all do that and a lot of times we all do that very publicly and again in the in this age of social media that we are living in right a lot of times we put our foot in our mouth very publicly don't we very very publicly i'm sure all of us have done that at some point in time hmm. so if since you, you you need to sincerely advise the first thing is that it should be for the benefit of the receiver to guide someone to a better way towards benefit and away from harm right and while you're doing that you are very very conscious that you preserve their reputation as much as possible so even when you are reprimanding your child it should not be in public right if somebody has posted something which is objectionable or has some issue or whatever you don't start a thing on social media right you don't do that and condemnation is what to announce someone's faults publicly with the intention of hurting their reputation or harming them in some way under the cover of giving advice oh we love to do that don't you we love to no 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 i'm just giving advice and unfortunately our deeni sisters do that a lot unfortunately that's that that's a problem right in public no there's a huge difference between advising and condemning someone there's a huge and marked difference and shaitan sort of muddles it up for us right and we end up condemning instead of true advice because you see condemnation is motivated by hatred and a uh, malice and you know that thing that, that that thing in our heart perhaps jealousy yeah and went and publicly right it uh, it kind of ends up shaming rather than being beneficial it kind of ends up um embarrassing the other person to the extent that even if they were thinking of coming towards god say for example or towards something which is of benefit they will just be so put off by this attitude of condemnation they will say theek hai the way i am it's okay you know that's 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 something that we need to be very very careful about right then the other thing is esteem versus pride esteem versus pride shaitan confuses us in this aspect as well what is esteem there there are two ways to look at it one is esteem for other people and one is self esteem both things are included in this according to scholars right so when you have this esteem for other people 
that means that you have respect for them that means you have admiration and it is kind of a positive form of pride for example it is a very natural thing that people who a lot of time with teachers or with your elders or even in peers someone you kind of you have them in high regard because of the way they are because of what benefit they have given you what you know etc and some people are just cool people really i mean you really admire them and and you hold them in very high esteem alhamdulillah that's good that's very good but it's just like friendly competition that we talked about earlier this type of esteem and admiration <clears throat> is rooted in really loving intentions towards somebody else in confidence in them desire to be like them right without ever thinking that ya allah take this away from them and give it to me mm-hmm. so if we talk in a religious context like because this is a uh, this is alhamdulillah quran class so you kind of really like a teacher yeah you like like his or her style or you like uh, you know you're benefiting from them etc so you hold them in high esteem if an aspect of jealousy was to come in you would say Ya Allah, make me like that and take this away from them. That's so silly, isn't it? Then, then that is not really esteem, is it? That is not really esteem. That is that becomes jealousy, right? It's it's not even friendly competition anymore. Hmm? Zainab, the wife of Abdullah ibn Masood radhiyallahu taala an Zainab radhiyallahu anha, she said that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was endowed with esteem. Hmm? she and other women sahaba uh, and there were many men sahaba as well who held rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in such high regard that they were too shy to knock on his door they had this haya right um in this way you can be proud quote and quote of the achievement of your leaders your family members your children your friends without necessarily looking down on others a and b without necessarily puffing up their egos right so this this has a very fine line this holding other people in esteem don't puff up their egos that's going to cause fitna and problem for them whether it's your own child yes praise <clears throat> and hold them in high regard but puffing up egos is a terrible idea i think i say that a lot and many people say that it's not just me in you know refrain from just exhibiting your achievements or other your children's achievements on social media it's it's sometimes it, your intention might be just perhaps motivating others and, and hopefully inshallah most of us who tend to do that our intention is that hopefully but that's not a good thing it causes too much fitna for yourself why do you want 50 people saying oh my god that's so cool that's just so wonderful that you got an a star or you finished a certain course or you sort of you got admission in a very fancy bit why why do you want to put yourself through that i mean it's a look inside of you to think because this is shaitan might be working the strings over here right shaitan and you you're checking your that your your uh, uh, i don't know whatever it is insta or or facebook or whatever every once in a while to see acha now who else has commented how many likes have i got yeah that is ego coming into place that is ego coming into place yeah so we need to be very super careful about this and self esteem is to have respect for yourself it is to hold an image of self that is healthy and balanced neither arrogantly proud nor humiliatingly meek you know this artificial obsequiousness is not part of our being rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sunnah is not to just bash yourself up all the time hmm? even in terms of what you look like yeah one should be modest and one should be simple and uh one should not be displaying right but you should not be disheveled either once a man came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he had like you know his hair was all messed up and he was wearing like you know uh whatever rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not like that he said hasn't allah subhanahu wa taala blessed you with such and such he said yes ya rasulullah so he said then why are you looking like this rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself was a very well kept and a very well groomed person very well groomed and please understand that these guys who used to live in the desert there was hardly any water available and there was no electricity in those days that they were sitting in iron their clothes or yeah but 
make, keeping yourself physically presentable is also part of having self-esteem. It's got nothing to do with pride. It's not showing off. Again, this is a fine line. This is a fine line, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes acts of sin as oppression against our own self. There's a very common phrase in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we did not wrong them, but rather they have been wronging themselves. Uh, uh, one reference is Surah Furqan, right? They do zulm on their own selves by doing what? By either thinking too much of themselves or the other, uh, other side of the coin as well, or being like, uh, too, like, you know, humiliating themselves for no reason at all. Being meek to the, to the point of painful, yeah? That's not something that a believer does, right? And shaitan puts this in our hearts about others as well, by the way, and particularly people of deen. So you're going to see a Quran teacher hmm? living in a really cool house, yeah? Being well-dressed in front of her women students. So I'm talking about a woman over here, so in front of her women student, eh? you know, wearing makeup and jewelry and all of that, right? Whatever. And Shaitan might put it in your heart. Oh my God, what a show off. Oh my God, there's no simplicity over here. So there are certain programs which are like, you know, pretty jazzy, you know, so to speak. And people find it very hard to sometimes stomach the fact that you can have Quran in a beautiful and inviting environment with well-dressed people and serving beautiful food or whatever, it's X, Y, or Z. So understand the difference. Understand the difference over here between uh, esteem and pride. Esteem and pride. Rasulullah has said, none of you should say my soul is wicked. Rather, you should say my soul is at fault. Because when something is at fault, what does that mean? That there is room for improvement, right? It can be fixed. And we all make mistakes, right? So we should not attach uh, pessimistic, self-defeating, metaphysical labels like wicked and evil to ourselves. That's not good. Yeah, that's not good. Recognize the fault and remedy it. Work towards remedying it. That is important. That is important, right? Um, and what is pride, Kibr? Misguided belief that I'm so important, yeah? That I have the right to reject the truth and to humiliate others, or that I deserve special treatment of the sense of entitlement. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said, no one who has the weight of a seed of pride in his heart will enter paradise. It was said, but a man loves to have beautiful clothes and shoes. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahu jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. Pride means rejecting the truth and looking down upon people. Right? So understand what kibir means. Understand what pride means. And understand the difference between uh, understand the difference between uh, what is pride and what is esteem. So these important distinctions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know because this is where shaitan attacks big time in terms of the state of our hearts. Love for Allah versus love for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reverence versus hypocrisy. Where did my verse go? Inspiring gratitude versus boasting. Hmm? Friendly competition versus envy. Authentic leadership versus love for authority. Tawakkul versus laziness. Sincere advising versus condemning. And esteem versus pride. Yeah. Extremely important. And is this something that you and I can learn just by going through it like we just did in two, two sessions? No. This is something that we need to visit and revisit and visit and revisit Constantly, constantly. This is something so important that we need to do that. So conceptually distinguishing between these virtues and their corrupted counterparts is crucial for our spiritual and moral development. 
absolutely crucial. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmanullah, he said, the entire religion consists of the ability to distinguish. That is why the Quran refers to itself as al-Furqan, the distinguisher, right? Something that separates the guidance within these pages and the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah help us distinguish the light from the darkness, not only in the world, but within our own selves. Remember, we started this discussion with talking about the darkness within our own selves. Yeah. And where are we going to get this guidance? From the Quran and from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is one very, very special reason and very important reason that we need to stick to it. And this guidance is not something that you get once, one time, and then that's it, it's over. We need to keep reviewing all of this, these concepts constantly within ourselves and finding different ways of looking at different angles for these. Right? Misguidance, error, and straying away from the straight path are the result of confusing and convoluting the nature of two things that are separate in reality. Hmm? That are separate in reality. Let's, if we go back to this slide, yeah, you see, these things are completely separate in reality. And what Shaitan, the way he beautifies, say, for example, boasting that, no, 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 actually it's inspiring gratitude. Envy, oh, this is just friendly competition. Love for authority, oh, this is authentic leadership. We need to know all of this, right? If we don't know the reality and we don't separate it in our heads and in our hearts, then it is a failure on our part to discern matters as they truly are. Then we are deluding ourselves and shaitan is pushing us into that direction hmm? because we have made an inaccurate mental repre representation of all of this yeah sorry yeah and uh, according to scholars the the most serious of these errors is to place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside the creation. If we come back to the slide again, so we have, right, to place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So our, our inner, inner self has the tendency to blur the lines between virtue and vice and to rationalize and justify states of mind uh, that are in truth serious character flaws. I need to have that honesty within myself, right? And I need to understand that shaitan is beautifying certain things which are most certainly not endorsed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There will always be forces inside of us that will attempt to muddy the waters between what is right and wrong rather than identifying them as absolutely separate. These forces represent the dark side within us you know, within, my, within our own self, in, in our, within our own souls and egos, whatever you want to call it. And these are the forces that we need to be aware of at all times, at all times, right? And the dark side can only be conquered by the light. And the source of that light is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyam, rahmanullah, has also said that this furqan, the ability to distinguish honors the one with this knowledge, right? And he calls al, al, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Furqan as well, right? He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors us with knowledge of this distinction, right? May Allah, and when, when will that happen? When we become true seekers, right? When we become true seekers. One of Shaitan's plots is that he always bewitches people's mind until they are deceived. No one is saved from his sorcery except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. He makes attractive to the mind that which will harm it until a person thinks of something as most beneficial. And he discourages him from that which is most beneficial until he thinks that it will harm him. La ilaha illallah. How many people have been tempted by this sorcery? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this, right? And according to Ibn Qayyim, he goes on to say that whoever lacks this ability to distinguish will most certainly fall into shirk, right? And he says shirk of the devils. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in whom to seek refuge and he is the one upon which upon whom we should rely at all times. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that favor of distinction, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. And the gift of this divine light is attained through what? Dua, mindfulness, study, seeking, yeah, purity of the heart. And that is our hope for salvation, inshallah, inshallah, not only in the next life, but also in this life. It is the only light by which we can see with states of being, you know, what the real states of certain situations are, right? And then we need to have this fighting chance to conquer this nafse amara bil su, which the devils exploit, which shaitan exploits, right? Then if you look at the next part of the ayat, alhamdulillah, we looked in great detail at what in zayyina lahumu shaitan wa amalahum. Special reference to context was the Battle of Badr, but we looked at it from a much broader perspective. Right? Then Shaitan went on, uh, went on to say that I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See over here, when he saw the angels right, siding with the believers on the battlefield, he just turned his back on the disbelievers, on the kuffar, and he said, okay, I'm off, and I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I see what you do not see. Right? I see what you do not see. So what is this fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? According to Ibn Raja of Rahmatullah, the one who fears Allah is not the one who simply cries and his eyes overflow with tears. Rather, the one who really fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who leaves that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, even though his heart desires it and he has the ability to carry it out. That is real fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let not shaitan delude us into thinking what is real fear and what is virtual fear. That is also one thing that he muddies for us, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you are. Follow a bad deed with a good deed. And fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another word for that is what? Taqwa. Ittaqillah. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hey suma kunt. Wherever you are, have this taqwa. Follow a, uh, follow a bad deed with a good deed and it will erase it and behave with good character towards people. Yeah. yeah. This is a very, very uh, uh, important advice that you and I need to stick to. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who he gives the ability to distinguish, who he gives the furqan to our hearts so that we see dark from light, right from wrong, sin from righteousness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to have, give us the, uh, the tawfiq, to have this real taqwa, to have this real fear that we are absolutely 100% conscious of him wherever we are and whatever it is that we're doing. Then in ayah number 49, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, when the hypocrites and those who have a malady in their hearts said, the belief of these people has deluded them. And whoever places his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mighty and wise. Whenever there was a phase of struggle, when it is time for personal sacrifice, whenever there was and is actually, whenever there was, because this is talking about Badr, so which was a phase of struggle, yeah. And for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, there was a continuous one thing after the other, one thing after the other that they had to sacrifice and they had to struggle and they had to do mujahada against. So it happens today as well, right? And we're not talking about armed conflict. We're talking about this struggle for the establishment of being. Whenever there's time like that, at any stage in history or, or, or for us this present time, the Muslim community gets divided into three groups, broadly speaking. The first is one group is sincere believers, right? Who are not, not at all calculating, who do not worry about any personal loss or gain. Their total and complete loyalties are with the cause, right? You will see in Surah Al-Anfal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully, wonderfully, Allah being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, talks about our personal faiths, which is, which is our heart, which is connected with God, right? And he talks about us as an ummah, right? 
both are equally important. You will see that in every, you know, you will see that in these discussions, and I hope that you have pinpointed that as well, and you've realized that how important is this personal faith, as well as being part of this ummah, right? And struggling to for the cause, taking Islam as a cause, right? So, um, so when one are those sincere believers, right? The the second group is the monafiq, the two faced, who do not want the establishment of the anywhere who have this malice and hatred for Islam in their hearts. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about over here in 49. And the third group is weak believers. I mean, they do not have hatred um, and they're okay if deen is established somewhere, right? But they can't be bothered to be part of the effort to establish that deen. They're very wary of self-sacrifice or putting themselves on the line or putting their interests on the line, yeah? So these three distinct groups happen, right? And the hypocrites over here are not being directed by shaitan, actually. Shaitan has already left the battlefield. We, we, we saw that in, in the previous fire in 48, right? So what's going on over here? So there are these two whispers, the two waswas, the waswas of shaitan and the waswas of our own nafs, right? The whispers are coming from the nafs of the hypocrites. Because when you are friends with the dark side, the dark side overpowers you. Yeah? And then you become like that. Uh, my teacher used to give this lovely example that if a naughty child, you know, your, your child is very well behaved. A naughty child comes to visit and stays. And after they leave, your child has picked up certain things from there and they're still doing it. So the child, the naughty one is gone. But your child who was well behaved and always picked up certain things. So the more we spend time with those with diseases in their hearts who show enmity to being openly, right? Openly, or sometimes in very subtle ways, the more we are open or we are making ourselves vulnerable, making our hearts vulnerable to that influence. Yeah. So they would view these uh, uh, these hypocrites these munafiqun would view anyone who followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam unconditionally as stupid, as blinded. Hmm? Sounds so familiar, doesn't it? So Badr, the lessons from Badr are not, not just for the Sahaba and for that time, but very much pertinent to you and me today, right? This is their issue that they have no reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? For an outsider to go up against the Quraysh in battle would be crazy. But that is because they have no reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the authority to take out the army, And he does not call one to do something unwise because he himself is full of wisdom. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying over here in ayah number 49. Then in ayah 50, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, only if you were to see them when the angels take out the souls of those who disbelieve, <laughs> beating their faces and their backs and saying, taste the punishment of the flaming fire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the fire. And if you could only see when the angels are going to be taking away disbelievers, they will be beating them on their faces and on their backs and taste the punishment of the torturous flame. This is due to what your hands sent ahead and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not cruel to his servants. Now these ayat, ayah number 50 and ayah number uh, uh, 51, scholars say are uh, an evidence, a belief for the uh, punishment of the grave, for the punishment of the grave, right? Allah al-Qabr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 93, and if you could see when the wrongdoers are in the agonies of death, this is the time of death, right? Right now, this what is mentioned here and what is mentioned in ayah number 50 is not talking about the day of judgment has happened and some people are going to heaven and some people are going to hell. No, this is a time of death that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, right? And if you could see when the wrongdoers are in the agonies of death, while the angels stretch their hands out saying, deliver up your souls. Rasulullah yeah? has given us very detailed account of what happens at the time of death. 
Qiyama, right? um, our Qiyama is actually established when we die, right? The, the, the process, the journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, physical, begins at the time of death. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a very long hadith, and of course this is paraphrased, has told us, when the believing servant is leaving this dunya and going on to the hereafter, angels with white faces as if their faces were in the sun descend upon him. With them is a shroud from the shrouds of paradise and perfume for embalming from the perfume of paradise. So they sit away from him at the distance, uh, at the distance that I can see. And then the angel of death, Malikul Maut, comes and sits by his head and says, Oh, good soul, come out to forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his pleasure. He says, he said, so it comes out just as a drop flows from the mouth of the drinking vessel. And he takes it, but does not leave it in his hand even for, for, the, for the blink of an eye until they take it and place it in that shroud and that perfume. And there comes out from him a smell like that of the best must found upon the face of the earth. This is happening when the life of the believer is taken by molecular moth. So basically at the time of our death, we will pretty much know where this this uh, uh, caravan is going, yeah? What's happening over here, right? But when the unbelieving servant is leaving this dunya and going into the uh, akhira, angels with black faces descend upon him as far as the eye can see. And Malikul Maud comes and sits by his head and says, oh foul soul, come out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this displeasure and anger. So the soul, Spreads and, and, and in certain narrations, it says the soul hides in the body, right? And the angel of death drags it out, just as a pronged roasting fork is pulled out of the wool, shredded to pieces. So he takes it but does not leave it in his hand for the blink of an eye until they put it into those coarse sack cloths. And please always note one thing. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the hereafter, talks about death, talks about abr, there are only two places that are mentioned. There are two places that are mentioned. There's no third or fourth option. That is also something to very seriously internalize and think about. Yeah? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the azab al qabr and from azab of the fire. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us this beautiful dua, which we must, must, must make a part of our daily routine. Allahumma a'inni ala ghamarat al mawti wa sakarat al maut. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help me in the throes of death and the unconsciousness of death. Who will be there? Today we have reliance on X, Y, Z, Falana, influencer and Dimkana friend and so-and-so relative and Amma and Abba and Nani and Dadi and Parosi. Everyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who will be there to help me in the throes of death except my Allah? Allahumma a'inni ala ghamarat al mawti wa sakarat al mawti. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, their way is like the way of the people of Fir'aun and of those before them. They rejected the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees them for their sins. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong and severe in punishment. Don't ever forget the mightiness and the ghadab of your Lord. Ever. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these ayat in the Quran, it is to instill that taqwa which will sort of push us into action towards righteous deeds, inshallah, inshallah, right? So like the continuous legacy of Fir'aun and those who came much before them, they disbelieved in the revelations of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees them because of their continual sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mighty and intense in taking revenge, right? So this word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used, dab, it means, means to walk continuously. The continuous chain of the lineage of Fir'aun. They were a huge big dynasty, wasn't it? Right? Uh, all this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one who may change a favor he has conferred on the people unless they change their own condition. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and all knowing. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing uh, uh, the legacy of Fir'aun with the legacy of the Mushrikeen. Right? 
because what they were, they were also as arrogant right allah subhanahu wa taala got them uh, uh, okay we we'll, we'll discuss that later Let, let's see this ayat number 53 first um so allah subhanahu wa taala in ayah number 53 is saying that this ayah kind of occurs in two ways according to the mufassirun previously it was mentioned by allah subhanahu wa taala that allah does not make the situation of a nation better until they change it in themselves right allah subhanahu wa taala would not be the one to alter or deteriorate or take away the favor he had given to a nation in other words once a nation changes this is talking about a community again this is not an individual thing this is a community thing once a nation changes what is in themselves it will be the cause of their downfall so as a community it is very important to understand that for you and me we are believers in our hearts submitting to allah subhanahu wa taala but we are also part of an ummah we are also part of a community and both again are equally important and these verses are saying that loudly and clearly and glaringly that if as a community your situation changes yeah so for example if we look at the muslim body the muslim umma from the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam up to now yeah weakness started and weakness started and weakness started and blah, 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 and where we are today so the favors that allah subhanahu wa taala had given us allah subhanahu wa taala is going to take away as well right just like what happened with the bani israil just like what happened to firaun and particularly bani israil because they were the people of the book and allah subhanahu wa taala had given them so many privileges and then when they themselves became ungrateful became open sinners <clears throat> completely forgot allah subhanahu wa taala completely you know put aside the teachings of their prophets then what happened to them what up on top of what up allah subhanahu wa taala's wrath and anger on top of allah subhanahu wa taala's wrath and anger their practice is like that of the people of firaun and those before them they rejected the signs of their lord so we destroyed them for their sins and drowned the people of firaun and all of them were wrong doers now here again allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about the legacy of firaun why here allah subhanahu wa taala is giving us a similarity between ali firaun and the quraish right ali firaun and the quraish allah subhanahu wa taala took out uh ali firaun the people of firaun and firaun from egypt and drowned them in the red sea hmm? allah subhanahu wa taala took out the quraish from makka and destroyed them at badr yeah that is a parallel that allah subhanahu wa taala is drawing over here just in case you wonder that why is allah talking about firaun over here hmm? surely the worst of all the moving creatures in the sight of allah subhanahu wa taala are those who reject faith and do not believe hmm? in ayah number 55 the worst kind of beasts as far as allah is concerned are those who disbelieve and they are not going to believe now it is important to understand why the disbelievers are not even dignified as humans you know allah subhanahu wa taala is calling them they're the worst kind of moving creatures in the sight of allah why because our humanity and what made us superior to all other creatures Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said ahsan at taqwi right the best of creation is not our body right but it is that inside thing this ruh that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala blew into us the angels were commanded to acknowledge our superiority by making sajda to our body no what was the thing that was superior what was the thing that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala bestowed upon us which was so important when allah subhanahu wa taala has said when i have completed shaping him and have breathed into him of my spirit wa nafakh wa nafakhtu fihi mir ruhi that is what distinguishes a homo sapien from all other species that is what it is that is what it is and that is something which a disbeliever just doesn't get right or if they get a glimpse of it they don't see the power very powerful thing that allah subhanahu wa taala has put into us in a hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the ruh 
is uh, ha has attributed the ruh as noor, the light. And he said that the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was my light, meaning his ruh, which is a powerful creation of Allah. And that is what makes us truly human. A disbeliever denies this ruh. He buries the truth inside somewhere in the body. Right? So then after that, he's dead. He says, good is dead. The only aspirations left then are to feed his body, to beautify his body, to, to, to fulfill the demands of his body. So then what is the difference between us and an animal? An animal feeds and finds shelter and takes care of his body because it doesn't have that ruh, right? So it's so important to realize and understand that, right? This certain scholars have defined it beautifully in another very sort of uh, a more contemporary way as this inspired special DNA that we have inside of us. This inspired intelligence that has the ability to detect right from wrong. This is all part of our roof. And then they say that think about the software program that God has coded for the universe. And this ruh is the distinguisher between that distinguishes us homo sapiens from all other creatures, whichever way you want to look at it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you bury that, if you deny that, if you reject this faith, yeah, and you do this kufr, that you're burying and hiding the truth and your ruh, the special distinguishing power that Allah has kept in, inside of you, then, the, then you are the worst of creatures. Those with whom you have entered into a treaty, then they break their treaty each time and they do not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? In ayah number 56, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, those who have taken mutual promise uh, from um, those who you have taken a mutual promise from, then they violated their promise with every opportunity they get, and they are not afraid of the consequences. Let's read a few verses and then we'll talk about it. So if you find them in war, deal with them in a way that those behind them have to disperse fearfully so that they take a lesson. And if you approach the breach from the people, then throw the treaty towards them in straightforward terms. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like those who breach the treaty, right? So these few ayats uh, are talking about a very important ethical principle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the ethics of dealing with animosity, dealing with the enemy, right? The worst animal is the one who makes a promise and violates it. Now this can be in terms of uh, international treaties between countries, between organizations, whatever, right? This can be a political treaty and specific reference to context is the treaty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with the Jews and with all the other tribes of uh, uh, that were surrounding Medina and particularly the Jews. So a believer is bound by any treaty he makes and the only way he can violate them is that he has to openly say that now this treaty is broken, right? And he's declaring war. Etiquettes and ethics of social contracts, political con contracts, and even uh, contracts between enemy, with an enemy, are a big part of our deen. Yeah? There is no khayana, there is no cheating in any of it, right? So if a believer does not do that, then he does not have any right to violate the street. Yeah. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. So if you find them on the battlefield, then you give them the type of, type of punishment that whoever is behind them, they remember. Some Jews were actually on the battlefield in Makkah, so they were caught. When the Muslims inquired about this, because please remember that they had a treaty with the Jews, right? Uh, they were told that uh, those who were in the battlefield did not represent the Jews who had made the treaty. They did not act on behalf of them and they had no authorization from them to engage in this armed conflict. They deny their connection to them. So the firm policy of Islam became that you don't act against a nation or send spies to a nation if you have a treaty with them. 
look at the Islamic ethics and look at where this dunya is going and where us Muslims have, have, have come to. This is not something which was taught in the Quran. This was not something that was uh, 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 taught or, or the example we have of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If Muslims have a peaceful relationship with a nation, they cannot have any covert operations occurring without the knowledge of these nations. First, you have to declare that diplomatic ties have, you know, are broken before any action can be taken against that. This is the ethics of Muslim foreign policy, according to certain scholars, right? Then in ayah number 59, I mean, talk about being a civilized being, right? Then ayah number 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the disbelievers should never think that they have surpassed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine punishment. Surely they cannot frustrate so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting the believers at ease over here, right? After the great loss at Badr, the Makkans are going to be seeking revenge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Muslims, don't be afraid because they will not be able to overpower you. Then Allah goes on to say in ayah number sorry, 60, prepare against them whatever force you can and the trained horses whereby you frighten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's enemy and your own enemy and others besides them whom you do not know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is known, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them. Whatever thing you spend in the way of Allah, it will be paid to you in full and you shall not be wronged. Right? So in ayah number 60, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to the believers that um, stay on the alert, right? Stay on the alert. If spies are sent to the believers, they will see that they are always on alert and ready for war and they will become terrified. So a believer's community should not be um, at the mercy of anybody who would want to kind of overpower them, right? So they need to be militarily prepared, right? And have their resources ready in case of any threat from anywhere. Currently, if you had, if we look at special reference to context to Badr, and at that time to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, there were two known enemies, the Quraysh and any Jew who violated the treaty. The unknown enemy that is being referred to here, right? And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that and others besides them whom you do not know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the hypocrites over here, right? The Muslims, however, have not been given the license to point the finger at those who are acting against them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that it is only he who knows who they are. Look at the justice of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And see Sabilillah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Wama uh, min shay'in fi sabilillah. So fi sabilillah over here specifically refers to the money that is spent to further the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to make Islam victorious in Makkah, right? And then by that proxy in the entire region. This doesn't refer to spending on the orphan or those in need or any other cause other than military expeditions or migration. In this particular ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to that specific cause. And if they tilt towards peace, you too should tilt towards it and place your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surely he is the all hearing and all knowing. So uh, over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you look at this word, janaha, it means wings, right? When a bird raises it, its wings, it means it is about to attack. And when it lowers its wings, it means that it is at peace and it's peaceful, you know, and just kind of being cool. So if the enemy ceases, you put your weapons down and stop fighting too. Yeah, that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in ayah number 61. In 62, if they intend to deceive you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all sufficient for you. He is the one who supported you with his help and with the believers. It's such a beautiful ayah, actually. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here is uh, communicating directly with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he aided Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by sending down angels, right? And also by 
uh, uh, with it, with the believers, with the Sahaba. This is such a beautiful verse, such an honor uh, uh, given to the Sahaba that uh, he's placed Allah's special divine help with the Sahaba, uh, the one who supported you with his help and with the believers, and with this believers, the same category, right? He honored the Sahaba by saying that they are a gift to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what scholars say is that even today, when we truly attempt to take part in da'wah and take part in establishing a community like that of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we are aiding the mission of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will be honored inshallah, inshallah by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, right? Um, with the help of the believers and united their hearts. Had you spent all this, all that, uh, had you spent all that is on earth, you could not have united their hearts. So this love, this, this unity of the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed between the believers' hearts, the, the Sahaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa no matter what you had done or any human being would have done, this love could not have come. But Allah did unite their hearts. Surely he's almighty and all wise. So lesson for us is what? that today the hearts of believers are absolutely split up. There are God knows how many denominations. Wallahu alam how much hatred and malice and infighting is going on. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the turner of hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who puts love and respect and care for each other in the hearts. So shouldn't we pray like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us, Allahumma alif bayna qulubina oh allah put affection between uh, affection amongst our hearts Set right our matters between ourselves. Guide us to the ways of peace. Save us from darkness towards light. Save us from all kinds of indecency, the apparent as well as the hidden. And bless our hearings and our seeing and our hearts, our spouses and our children. And turn in mercy upon us, Ya Rabbi. Indeed, you are the one who greatly accepts repentance, one who is repeatedly merciful. Ameen, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayyuhan nabi, hazbukullah wa manit tabaqa min al mu'mineen. Allah is sufficient for you and the believers who followed you. Again, the shan of the sahaba over here. Shan of the sahaba. And imagine, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who have this honor of being the ones who followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, rouse the believers to fighting. If there are 20 among you who are patient, they will overcome 200. And if there are 100 among you, they will overcome 1,000 of those who disbelieve because there are people who do not understand. Now over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to motivate the believers to qital, right? Motivate the believers to qital. Now, Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about motivation for, for something which is nafil, this is not for this is for the kifaya, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always motivated with love. This is sunnah. Never with hate or negative emotions against the other. That was one thing. And the other thing was that Islam never motivates by promising this dunya by promising success and titles and power and money and, uh, and position. No, it's always talking about belief in the promises of God. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always told, told his companions, aspire for Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, telling us that people who go into a battle and understand why they are fighting are more powerful than those who do not know why they are fighting. That's a very precious lesson for you and me. Even though we are not involved in armed conflict, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that, but there is definitely a fight against Qatar. There is definitely a, a conflict which is tangible, 
between haq and batil. If you are on side of the haq, know what you're fighting for. Whether you are using your pen, and most certainly use your pen, whether you're using your social media, whether you are involved in any kind of dawah activity, right? That is your fighting against batil, right? Know why you're doing it. Understand why you're doing it. Because if you do it out of understanding, only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, we have done this verse in Surah Anfal before, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us what is the purpose of this conflict. The purpose is what? That the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is established. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is higher than anything else. Allah hu akbar kutira. That Allah is akbar everywhere. Because that is what he deserves. This, this dunya, me, everything in it is Allah's. And his name must be Akbar. That is the reason. Right? And when you have that reason, why do you think there is this absolute power in submission? When you submit to that reason, then you understand why you're fighting. Whether in the battlefield or within your own home or on social media or whichever way that you are involved in da'wah activity. As opposed to those who do not know why they are fighting. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 66, now Allah has lightened you up and he knows among you there are weak ones. Then if there are 100 of you who are patient, you will overcome 200. And if there are among you a thousand, then you will overcome 2000 by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. Now in, in the ayah before, what was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? That 20 of you will overcome 200. Over here, when weakness came, and how did the weakness come? Did the Muslims decrease in number? No, Iman decreased. This is not referring to physical weakness, but weakness of faith, yeah? So first, if it was uh, 20 against 1,000, uh, uh, 20 against 200, now it's become 100 against 200, right? And if there are 1,000 among you, they will overcome 2,000 by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wallahu ma'ashwabirin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are steadfast and patient, right? A strong Muslim army, one to 10. A weakened army of the believers, one to two. Some scholars have derived battle strategies from this, right? That Muslims should not go into a battle if the number is greater than one to 10. So one believer for every 10 disbelievers. So the army of Quraysh was what, thousand? Was approximately, whereas the uh, believing army of Rasulullah was approximately 300. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reversed the proportions here. The Muslim army by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had 10 times the advantage, right? 10 times the advantage. And this advantage in whichever battlefield you are in, again, I uh, uh, understand that, that how relevant it is for you and me as well. If it is not armed conflict, which we are not involved with, it most certainly is a type of conflict which is getting tangible and tangible and tangible day by day. Raise your voice, use your voice, use your influence, use your resources, because that is part of declaring your faith and being part, part of our Iman. It is not, uh, okay, ayah number seven. It is not becoming of any prophet to have prisoners of war until he's done shedding blood on the earth. Do you prefer worldly life and Allah wants the final outcome and Allah is the ultimate authority, the all wise? Mm -hmm. uh, had there not been a decree from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came earlier, great punishment would have overtaken you because of what you have taken. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses is talking about the prisoners of war. After Badr, because it was a victory, an ar uh, argument happened uh, 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 regarding what to do with the prisoners of war, right? Some of them were family, remember? We, we, when we talked about the background of the Battle of Badr, uh, a lot of the uh, Quraysh and a lot of Bakkan army, the family of the Sahaba. In some cases, the Sahaba tightened the ropes on their relatives because they did not want to feel as though they were having any love for them because of their relation. Abu Bakr ta'ala unsuggested that some of them should teach them how to read and write, and then we should release them on, uh, uh, as compensation for their work, right? Omar ta'ala unthought that this would be a good time to test loyalty. They should find those from the Mahajirun who are related to the prisoners and they should kill them. 
we should determine whether their loyalties lie with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or whether they lie with their tribe and their family. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preferred the option given by Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and then this ayah was released, uh, was revealed that he should have killed them. Now imagine the imagery here is violent because it is in the context of the battlefield. Until the time when you have completely annihilated your enemy, there are to be no prisoners of war. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying over here, right? So um, what happened was, and we know that the exemplary treatment that the, uh, the prisoners of Badr got was unheard of in those days and even now, yeah? So according to scholars, two lessons are derived from this the relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger, right? No one has the right to challenge the decisions made by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a lot of istighfar after this ayah was revealed. Yeah, over here. Um, and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, when this ayah came down, felt pretty humiliated because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks if they prefer this life to the life of the world, uh, if they prefer the life of the world. Although you can understand that, that these were all strategies. The reason this is said is actually quite beautiful because there are two goals in Khardi, the pursuit of Jannah and victory in this life. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to uh, dunya, he's talking about the victory of Islam in this dunya. And the higher purpose is what? The purpose of the pursuit of Jannah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then in Ayah 68, we just did that. Then Ayah 69, so each of the spoils you have got, lawful and pure, right? And fal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ghanim, uh, ghanam, ghanam, we talked about that. Ghanam is also anfal, the spoils of war. So consume these uh, uh, anfal because they have been made lawful and pure for you. And surely Allah, uh, and fear Allah and have taqwa of Allah, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and very merciful. O Prophet, ya ayyuhan nabi, uh, say to the prisoners in your hands, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows any goodness in your hearts, he will give you something better than what has been taken from you and will forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and very, very merciful, right? If any of the prisoners that were captured, even though they were fighting against the believers, un uh, and they were fighting against the unbelievers unwillingly, and they have faith in their hearts, then a ransom must be taken from them. Once they migrate to Medina, right? They will receive the ransom back and even more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is all merciful. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying that you should have killed all the prisoners, it did not include those who had iman in their hearts, you know, somewhere. Please don't think that this is something so bloodthirsty and violent. No, Allah is saying immediately, he's talking about prisoners of wars, and this is also talking about prisoners of war. Those who, for some reason, got, maybe they were slaves, maybe they were forced by, by, for some reason, to fight against the believers. But they had that faith in their hearts, although physically they were fighting against the believers, against the Sahaba, against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is Afurur Rahim. And if they intend to commit treachery against you, then they have already committed treachery, uh, treachery against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in turn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you full control over them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all wise, right? Surely those who believed and migrated and carried out jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their wealth and their lives and those who gave refuge and help to the immigrants, both are close friends to each other. And those who believed and did not migrate, you have no friendship with them at all unless they migrate. However, if they seek your help in the matter of faith, then you are bound to help except against the people with whom you have a treaty 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watchful over what you do. Right? This is a, such a beautiful, beautiful ayah. This is an absolutely beautiful verse. Let's see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying over here. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about loyalties over here, right? Huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about loyalties. Yeah. Who, the ones who believed, who did hijra, right? Who did jihad with their, 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 um, wealth and their own nafs, yeah? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, fi sabilillah, right? And those who gave refuge, the ansar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in special reference to context, is talking about the mahajireen and the ansar, right? That those who left their homes and came to Medina and those who welcomed them with open arms and helped them in every which way that you can think of. One of the first things we talked about that earlier before that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did when they came to, they came to Medina was to establish this bond of brotherhood between the uh, uh, the Muhajir and the people of Medina who were the Ansar, the believers of Medina. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying that they are the ones who are close friends to each other. Ulaika baaduhum awliya ad baad. Right? They are close friends. They love each other. They are wali of each other. They have this relationship of Bilaya, right? This, with this relationship of love, right? So, um, Abdullah ibn Amr and reported that a person asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, which hijra is best? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to move away or to migrate away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed. So today we are living in a time where perhaps physical hijrah is not demanded of us, yeah, wherever it is that we are living. Mm -hmm. But if we want to be part of this ayah, we have to migrate towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala internally, the state of our heart, our lifestyle. Yeah? When you change internally, when you are trying to go from darkness towards light internally, then you will make different lifestyle choices. Yeah? It, is, it will be visible. So that is one thing that you and I need to strive for. Then <clears throat> Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, among Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's servants are people who are neither prophets nor martyrs, but whom the prophets and martyrs will deem fortunate because of their high status with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, who are those people? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they are people who loved each other for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. That was the only criteria of loving each other. Even without being related to one another or being tied to one another by exchange of wealth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to describe their great reward on the day of resurrection. By Allah, their faces will be luminous and they will be, there, they will be upon light. They will feel no fear when the people will be feeling fear. And they will feel no grief when people will be grieving. Then he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, recited uh, uh, the verse of Surah Yunus, verse number 62. Behold, verily on the friends of Allah there is no fear, now nor shall they grieve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our small virtual community, that alhamdulillah we are over here, love each other, have close, have this feeling in our heart for each other, only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we have a chance of being part of these people that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about. Purely loving someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. No other reason. Most certainly they can be your relatives, right? But purely for the sake of Allah. No other ties, yeah? Nothing else is supreme to that except the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That both of you love each other or a group of people loves each other for the sake of Allah. Have this feeling of malaya. Right, have this feeling of my And those who disbelieve are friends to each other. If you do not do so, there shall be disorder on the earth and a great corruption. So what is Allah talking about over here? That the believers have this vilaya with each other. Yeah. And those who disbelieve, they are also protective friends, loyal to one another. If you don't come out and assist your people, 
there will be great trials and tribulations in the land and a huge corruption will follow. If some of the Muslims were weak and were unable to make hijra at that time, yeah, and let's talk about it in today's context as well, and no one came to assist them, they would leave Islam. Then you would have a population of people who tasted deen and then purposely left it. You cannot leave them. You have to be a supporter. You have to be a supporter, right? Today we see all over the world, right? Whether people say it with their tongue or, or not, there are many people who, don't, who say that I don't believe in Islam anymore. There are many young people who are saying that I am uh, an atheist or I am an agnostic. Hmm? What is one to do? What is one to do? Are you going to shun them? Are you going to kick them out of the house? Hmm? So there is this young woman who's taken her hijab off. And there are many young women around the globe who have taken their hijab off. What do you want to do? Ostracize them or support them? Hmm? Ostracize them or support them? That is something to think about. If the weakness is there and they are unable to change their position. There are many times that we get pretty concerned and upset about people who have been, say, for example, attending uh, sessions and classes for years and years and years, and you don't see any apparent change in their lifestyle or in their priorities or in their choices. Sometimes it can be very distressing. But what is one supposed to do? Leave them, not support them anymore, right? Or are you supposed to have a dress code before every Quran class? Send me your picture. If you're wearing a hijab, you can come in. If you're not, then you're not welcome. If we are not going to support people who have weak iman or whatever reasons that they have, and it is general, it, it boils down to the fact that they have some problem in their heart, right? Some weakness of faith. That is the problem. And they are unable to make this hijra. Then we need to support them even more. Then we need to take time out even more, right? Then we need to show them the picture, the, you know, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. We can't abandon them. We can't shame them on social media, right? We can't post pictures of before and after hijab. We can't, we should not be doing that. That would be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, right? That the disbelievers were friends to each other. Were you friends with those who had a bit of weak iman? Who had a little bit of weakness in them? Did you support them or did you just leave them? You cannot leave them purposefully because if you do that, then they are going to go really far, far away from being. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that, that you and I become a reason for, you know, pushing people further, further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the, 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 the bridge that brings them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. And it is only Allah who changes hearts. Yeah, we can only be little helpers here and there. Those who have believed and migrated and carried out jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who gave refuge and help, both are the believers in truth. For them, there is forgiveness and a respectful provision. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 74 is talking about two categories of true believers, mahajir or ansar, those who migrate and those who are the helpers, right? Those who believe and migrated and struggled in the path of Allah and those who protected and assisted them, those are the true believers. They will be forgiven and given, an, uh, they will have forgiveness and a noble compensation. Every time there is struggle, every time there is time for, um, you know, these are just two categories. Where do you fall? Where do you and I fall, right? When uh, Iman is sometimes dormant in the heart, right? Sometimes dormant in the heart. And when Wahi descends, so whether you're sitting in a Quran class or you've had a premonition, whatever it is, there's something happens in the heart. There is some, some the heart is going like tuk, 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 yeah? with Allah, right? heart gets soft and the, 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 the seed of Iman starts sprouting. It starts sprouting. Then it needs two things. The first is food for the soul. Yeah. Food for the soul. And the other is protection. 
protection from shaitan, protection from the winds of qatil, all of that. It needs that, yeah? Um, just like the relationship between the small child and the mother, right? What does a little mom do? What does a mother do for the little baby? Feed and protect. That is the first, first two things that are needed for nourishment, right? Iman should be completely wrapped with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Iman is in the heart, yeah? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance is in the heart, right? But for protection, you need some outside assistance as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes people means of protection for the, the, the one whose iman is now sprouting. Why is it that it is always a good idea to have this synergy of a Quran class, right? Even if it's virtual these days. Why is it better that way? Because you support and strengthen each other. Because you hear each other's stories and say, okay, so I'm, be, I'm experiencing this as well. Because once that Iman is sprouting in your heart, it is probably not sprouting. It's still dormant in people who are physically close to you, maybe your family and your friends. And you have no way of discussing the situation of your heart with anybody other than the one who's going through it themselves. So one of the greatest advantages and perks of a Quran class, gaining knowledge, alhamdulillah, but another great advantage is to have like-minded people around who support each other, who empathize with each other, who protect each other. It's very important. So you have someone, you look at so-and-so and say, okay, so she's also struggling. Yeah? She's also struggling with the patta is on and off and on and off and on and off. Yeah? So am I, right? So you have a friend. You have someone who's going through exactly the same experience as you are, for example. Hmm? Then... After this environment is there, after this environment is there, then there is an absolute 100% change that is going to happen. It is, it, 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 it's not possible that the Iman sprouts and there is no change on the outside. And I'm not only talking about the clothes. I'm talking about the choices that you're making because you started Hijrah. You started Hijrah, right? You started Hijrah, so you are the Mahajir. So Mahajir support each other and those who have crossed that hurdle, who've already reached a certain place, it is imperative that they support them, the ones who are struggling in their, in their hijra. Yeah. So all of this is only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to scholars, these two categories are of for the two true believers. You are either a Mahajir or an Ansar. And if you're neither of them, then you really need to look at the state of your heart where you are. You know, you need to see whether the Iman has even sprouted or not. Because absolutely it is necessity that you are one of these. Either the Muhajir or Ansar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among these people. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Right? So the reference to true believers was first made in the second ayat of the surah, if you remember. Ayah number two, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Surah Al-Anfal, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, certainly the believers are those whose hearts are filled with awe when the name of Allah is mentioned. And when his verses are recited to them, it makes them more developed in faith and in their Lord, they place their trust. Right? Now we have come to the second last ayah of the surah. And reference to true believers has been made again. You know, over here in ayah number 74, this is the second last ayah. Alhamdulillah, we are almost about to finish the surah. So on the one hand, we have five responsibilities that form the pillars of faith, which is our personal iman, right? Now, these people were part of a mission after gaining faith. They were commanded to make hijrah at a particular time. Once they made hijrah, they were called to jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, hang on, oh, here. They were called to jihad on the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iman demanded that they provide shelter, the Ansar. Their Iman compelled them to aid the Muslims, the Muhajireen. They were all part of giving victory to Islam in that region in those days. Right? And the ayah number two over here. Uh, where is it? Ayah number two over here is talking about personal aspect of faith. 
here the believer is part of a cause, part of the work of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So like what we had mentioned before, it is imperative that we understand today that I cannot focus solely, solely on the spiritual aspect of faith and disregard the mission of Islam as an Islamic or the Islamic cause. So in our modern society, there is a divide between the two. This surah does not allow me to separate the two. The Quran does not allow me to choose priorities. Both are important, both are re relevant, and both tell us or tell me personally where the state of my heart is, whether I have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, whether I fall into the category of a believer who is willing to put myself on the line for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. My personal faith and my community commitment, both are there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who understand this important aspect that Islam is not a personal matter. Personal matter is submitting to Allah to the best of my ability. And then I have to be part of the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in any way that I can be. And there are many different ways. And Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this little effort that we are getting together, trying to learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, trying to learn what it means to be a true believer, trying to learn what it means to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying to get strategies to repel the attacks of shaitan on us, trying to see what is haq and what is batil. This is most certainly part of the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it with that. Whatever resources you and I have, and alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us a lot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to invest that in the propagation of our deen, in the mission of Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us strengthen our hearts with his remembrance, with his zikr, with his dua, with his prayer. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us strong Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us out from the darknesses into his light. And the last ayah of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who have, who have believed later on and migrated and carried out jihad amongst, uh, along with you, then they are joined with you. As for the womb relatives, they are closer to one another according to the book of Allah. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of everything. As we know, and we've talked about that how the relationship between the Muhajireen and the Ansar developed at that time. Hmm? But when it came to inheritance, right? When it came to inheritance, yes, they are your brothers in Islam, but your family is in, entitled to the in, inheritance and your family has rights over them, right? So the family's rights of inheritance are more than the right of your brother or sister in Islam. Although your heart might be connected more to your brother and sister in Islam. So you see this beautiful balance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's not leaving the family high and dry. Yeah. So the surah began with believers arguing amongst each other and it ends with believers being more united than ever with one another. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we pray to you that you accept this little effort and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we pray for you, to you that you make us all people who build bridges, people who try their level, level best to inspire others with love and with understanding. And Ya Allah, make us from among those who you are pleased with and give us the tawfiq to submit our hearts to you to the best of our abilities. And uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the tawfiq to complete this beautiful, beautiful surah. And uh, if you guys have any questions re related to this, because these are very important topics that we covered, um, then you can ask now for a few minutes. We have gone a few minutes over time, but we can go another five minutes more. Like always, you can send your questions in later on. Inshallah, inshallah. Next time, we will begin Surah Tawbah, which is the uh, ninth Surah of the Quran, and which is also in Juice number 10. If there are no questions, then we can wrap up for today, inshallah.
سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم ربنا جعلنا منهم الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحيم يا ذل جلال والإكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته